All right, this is where we stopped yesterday. We were uh, discussing stellar equilibrium and the role of uh, degeneracy pressure. Now, uh, let's uh, begin now by discussing a bit more about degeneracy pressure supported in, um, configurations. Uh, as you see, in, uh, there is a minimum density you know, <clears throat> below which you know, the you know, below which the you know, um, degeneracy pressure support does not yield a star at all. So it will you know, <clears throat> you know, yield you know, basically brown dwarfs. So there is a you know, certain degree of compression you need to achieve before you know you can uh, go through a nuclear burn stage. And you know, so there is a cutoff point here. And uh, that cutoff point will correspond to a certain mass which you know, intersects through this point. And uh, below that mass, you don't have stars, you have brown dwarfs. And that's about one hundredth of a solar mass. And stars exist above that point. So let's now expand you know, that region, you forget about the region which is below it. We'll talk about stars. Uh, let's you know, go to this. I'll go back to that slide in a moment. So now you know, we can look at the upper part of that you know, degeneracy pressure support diagram. And you know, we see that. You know, a typical star will require a support which is proportional to mass to the power of two thirds, density to the power of four thirds. And so it will be lines parallel to this. And since the upper part of this uh, degeneracy pressure support also has zero to the power of four thirds slope, so clearly you know, beyond a certain point, there cannot be any intersection with this uh, uh, degeneracy pressure supported line. And hence, those objects cannot be supported by uh, electron degeneracy pressure. And uh, so this limiting mass is the maximum mass of electron degeneracy supported configuration. And as I mentioned yesterday, you know, those stars which have gone through at least one stage of nuclear burning and then you know, are you know, supported by electron degeneracy pressure. It doesn't have to be the whole star which is you know, supported by that. The outer parts of the star can be lost, and uh, the inner part of the star finally makes the long-lived configuration. Those are called white dwarfs, and then white dwarfs will have the maximum mass, which is determined by this line. So, in, uh, if I go back in, uh, now, so in, uh, we have seen that in, uh, the degeneracy pressure support has rolled to the power of four thirds. Uh, at high density, or the power of five thirds at low density, and uh, when we uh, apply this condition, we can see that in the low mass regime, uh, this uh, relation will give us radius proportional to mass to the power minus one third, which means the higher the mass of the white dwarf, the smaller it is. So you know, as you make the white dwarf more and more massive, it gets more and more compact. If it's more and more compact, its density rises, and its uh, Fermi momentum therefore rises, and it moves towards being relativistic. So you know, as, it, as you keep adding more and more mass, therefore you then reach the limiting mass, which is given by this value. As you can see that this has Basically, just fundamental constants, which you know, determine the limiting mass, except for this composition, mu v, which is the number of atomic masses per electron that you know, the configuration has. Typically, once you have gone through one uh, stage of nuclear burning, then the neutron to proton ratio is uh, roughly similar. And you have you know, one electron per proton. So you know, 
the number of atomic masses per electron is about two. So this quantity numerically evaluates as 5.76 mu to the power minus two solar mass. Putting mu, mu equal to two, this yields a value of 1.44 solar mass. And that is the Chandrasekhar limit that we all know. That gives the upper mass limit of the white world. And in a, a more rigorous calculation will show you that in a, as you in a, increase mass, the radius will follow uh, this uh, relation and radius will go to zero as you uh, reach the Chandrasekhar limit. This is a figure from Chandrasekhar's own you know, computations. So what happens if the degeneracy pressure supported configuration happens to have mass above that limit? Then clearly there is no solution with the electron degeneracy pressure and the object will tend to get further compressed. Now, as you compress an object further, the electron degeneracy, you know, the Fermi momentum will continue to rise because the density rises, the you know, Fermi momentum is proportional to density, density to the power of one third, it will keep rising. And as it keeps rising, the Fermi energy, the energy associated with that energy, also keep rising. And at some point, the Fermi energy will become larger than the neutron proton mass difference. Now, if you take a neutron and leave it free in free space, the neutron will decay on an average of 11 minutes. And that is because the net energy of the electron plus proton the total rest energy is less than that of the neutron. And this mass difference is what causes this beta decay. But if the electron in the mixture of protons and electrons happens to acquire an energy which is larger than the neutron proton mass difference, then it becomes energetically favorable for the protons to capture those electrons and form neutrons. And that way, you reduce <coughs> the total energy budget. So, as you get to these higher and higher densities, the matter becomes more and more neutronized. And in, uh, at some point, you reach a density where you are almost equal to the nuclear density. So you, know, you have these nucleons almost touching each other. And at that point, you have a combination of neutron degeneracy pressure. So neutrons are also Fermi particles. Like electrons, they can produce degeneracy pressure and the repulsive strong interaction between neutrons, together providing support against gravity. And this kind of configuration has more than 90% neutrons and less than 10% protons and electrons. And that's what <coughs> keeps the beta equilibrium balance. The protons and electrons go to neutrons and the neutrons decaying back to protons and electrons because density is high, the fraction of neutrons is high to keep this um, um, reaction balance. So this is you know, the kind of compact stars which you, know, you would mostly be discussing in this um, in this uh, meeting. Um, the exact nature of neutron stars, what is there inside and so on is still uncertain because of the you know, knowledge of nuclear equation of state is you know, not perfect for us. And the reason for having discussions in this meeting, as well as other such meetings, is to try to get to you know, some better understanding of you know, what kind of matter property the neutron star interior does have. However, you know, whatever be the matter property, you know, the neutron stars also will have an upper mass limit like white balls. We don't know exactly how much that is, but you know, it could be somewhere between two to three solar mass. So, you know, but at some point, the, you know, if you keep adding mass, the mass will exceed the neutron star upper mass limit. And you know, then there is no stopping it. The you know, gravitational collapse will continue until the whole, you know, entire mass disappears behind the event horizon and the black hole results.
the neutron stars you know, formed this way have uh, you know, high density, of course. The internucleon distance is roughly about you know, one Fermi. And you know, so, you know, that gives you a density of about 10 to the power of 15 grams per cubic centimeter, which immediately tells you the radius should be about 10 kilometers for about one solar star. And that's what you know, we find from more detailed calculations. The radius of neutron stars are of the order of 10 kilometers for masses of the order of solar masses. Neutron stars also spin fast, you know, periods you know, running from milliseconds to minutes. You know, we all know that you know, pulsars are you know, the most widely known form of neutron stars. And they have very strong magnetic fields. <coughs> pulsars typically have teragauss magnetic fields. Some pulsars have you know, somewhat lower magnetic field and up to, you know, down to about 10 to about 8 gauss. And then there are magnetars which, you know, for which magnetic field work up to about 15 gauss. So therefore these are you know, really exotic objects, one of the most exotic objects in the universe, you know, giving rise to all this you know, very high energy activity. So these are the different varieties of stars that you know, we you know, encounter in nature. And you know, there is a connection between uh, stars which are born you know, from dilute gas by condensing and then starting nuclear burning and making their journey all the way to white dwarfs and neutron stars. And this entire process is called stellar evolution. And you know, let us now you know, try to describe the stellar evolution in a little more quantitative detail. So we, what I have uh, listed here are the set of equations which uh, are used to describe stellar evolution. So let me go through these equations one by one. These are written in <coughs> Lagrangian coordinates where the uh, independent coordinate is not radius, but mass included inside a certain radius. So that small m is the uh, independent uh, variable that is being used here. And uh, clearly by definition, uh, therefore dm dr is 4 pi r squared times density, so therefore del r del m is 1 by 4 pi r squared times density. So that in, in goes as the definition of the Lagrangian coordinate. The pressure gradient, uh, uh, we wrote the dp dr form of the hydrostatic equilibrium equation. In the Lagrangian coordinate, this can now be rewritten as dpdm as minus gm by 4 pi r to the power of 4 minus 1 by 4 pi r squared del 2 r del t2. So this tells you that there could be a, a term which, is, which describes the non-hydrostatic equilibrium part of the evolution. So if the star is actually not in mechanical equilibrium and its radius is changing each time, then the uh, pressure equation will take this form. If the uh, hydrostatic equilibrium is achieved, then this uh, second term goes to zero and you have only this part, which is what uh, we uh, can derive from the hydrostatic equilibrium equation written earlier. Uh, in the Newtonian form. Now, thermal transport occurs inside the star. There is energy generation at the center and uh, energy leaks out at the surface. And this can only happen if there is a you know, temperature gradient from, uh, in to, uh, from out to in, that is. Temperature is in higher inside, lower outside. And uh, so that can be written uh, in uh, uh, the you know, radiative transport you know, you know, equation as you know, del T del M as G M T by 4 pi r to the power of 4 times, you know, times pressure times this quantity you know, which is called you know, del and uh, that is a you know, logarithmic temperature gradient defined as D L N T D L N P. So this gives you an equation for the temperature gradient inside the star. And temperature gradient equation is needed to solve the uh, 
structural structural equation because the pressure is connected to density through temperature so the equation of state is connected through temperature so therefore to describe this stellar equilibrium we also need a equation to describe the distribution of temperature as well so that this gives you that now this transport of energy leaves the surface and that is what we call the luminosity of the star now this luminosity can be computed at any shell within the star uh, and uh, if you are anywhere within the star where there is no uh, energy generation taking place it's only energy transport then uh, no matter which surface you take the total energy crossing that surface is the same so in those regions del l del m will be zero but if you uh, go through the region where energy generation is taking place uh, then del and del m will not be zero and this expression uh, describes how uh, the uh, luminosity crossing a surface uh, which is described by the lagrangian coordinate m uh, changes with the lagrangian coordinate so here you have epsilon m this is the rate of um, generation of energy within the shell uh, by nuclear fusion epsilon nu which is the rate of loss of energy by um, taken away by neutrinos which is not being transported by you know, photons so therefore it does not count towards the radiative luminosity so this is the loss of energy you know, from within the same shell so you are adding this much energy taking away this much energy and if the star is not in mechanical equilibrium this shell can expand or you know, contract and if there is expansion or contraction then there is a work done and the thermodynamic you know, change in energy due to this um, uh, work done can be written as tds and which can be expanded in terms of the specific heat in constant pressure cp del t del uh, as a function of time plus delta by rho in change of pressure as a function of time where delta is given by the logarithmic deriv in, uh, derivative of density with uh, temperature at a constant pressure so uh, this whole term is nothing but t ds dt so this is uh, the uh, uh, rate at which the total internal energy content is changing because of um, mechanical changes in the structure of the star and the finally what we need is uh, the uh, equation of state which depends on the density on the temperature but it also depends on the composition and xi are the fractional abundances of you know, different species noted by i here i going from 1 to some capital i or capital i is a number of species and the at any given point the um, composition could be changing because of um, nuclear uh, reactions and the so del xi del t is given by m i over rho that is uh, the number number density and then uh, you have reaction rates this is summation over all other species j uh, the amount of Um, material of species i that is produced by all the other species in, a, in a j so summation over all those so that is the total amount produced per unit time in a, of species i and this is the decay or um, conversion of species i into other species so this is the rate at which the species is disappearing due to nuclear reactions and this is the rate at which the species is being generated due to nuclear reaction so this difference you see the rate of change of the composition of the species so this gives you the full set of uh, differential equations which 
one needs to solve to um, um, then model the um, evolution of the star. Now, <clears throat> when you talk about a star which is in the main sequence, we say that it's in equilibrium, so um, uh, we don't have um, really um, um, any significant evolution going on. So therefore, we can drop these you know, time-dependent terms and we can solve for you know, the stellar equilibrium. But usually it is not done like that because uh, you know, to you know, generate the you know, luminosity, you actually do have nuclear fusion going on. So there is a change in uh, composition always taking place in the interior and attendant to that, there is a change in structure. So stellar evolution equations are solved even to solve, you know, describe main sequence structure. So you know, this set of you know, evolution equations are the ubiquitous set of um, equations which are required to solve the structure and evolution of regular stars. Uh, so you know, to understand you know, importance of different parts of this evolution, let us look at you know, certain time scales which become important in different you know, stages of stellar evolution. One of the important time scale of uh, um, star is the dynamical time scale. The dynamical time scale is uh, the time scale in which the star can adjust its mechanical structure if the pressure support is way off or the pressure support is not there. Then the structure you know, will change or you know, it can collapse in what is called the free fall time scale. And this free fall time scale is given roughly by one over square root of Newtonian gravitational constant times average density of this uh, configuration. This is true for any configuration. So uh, it is true for the Earth as well. And uh, it is interesting that uh, in the Keplerian time scale uh, near the surface of the Earth is also going to be going to be given by this, or, on, uh, or for any self gravitating object. So uh, for the Earth, this quantity is about uh, 90 minutes. For the Sun, this quantity is about one hour. So <clears throat> if you suddenly take away the thermal pressure support in the Sun, the Sun will uh, suddenly collapse to a small object within an hour. So, uh, it tells you how important it is to have the you know, thermal pressure support, otherwise you know, the sun would last for a very little time. Now, thermal pressure support keeps the star you know, from collapsing, but suppose I take away energy generation in the interior. Then over a certain time, the thermal energy that is in the resident in the star is going to leak out. And over that time, the star is slowly going to change its configuration because as the total internal energy changes, the star is going to uh, get compressed by virial theorem. And uh, so that time scale is given by the total thermal energy content divided by the luminosity. The total thermal energy content is half of the gravitational energy content. So gravitational energy content is roughly gm squared by r. So in this quantity is roughly gm squared by 2r divided by l. So this quantity, if you put in the numbers for the sun and evaluate, it works out to be about 10 million years. So even if the nuclear reactions at the center of the sun stops today, the sun will continue to shine in a similar fashion for about 10 million years, after which you'll begin to see some changes in its characteristics. So this is called a thermal time scale or Kelvin Helmholtz time scale. But this 10 million years is still very small compared to, to the time for which we have known the sun to exist. And how long have we known the sun to exist? That comes from fossil records, that comes from isotope records in the earth, the, dating of the earth itself and so on. So that goes into billions of years. So uh, clearly, you know, without nuclear energy generation, you would not have the sun 
living for as long as you know, it actually has. The nuclear time scale then is given by the amount of nuclear fuel, the energy that you can get out of that fuel, divided by the luminosity. So you know, a certain fraction of the mass of the star you know, is you know, converted to energy. So this, you know, so if you take the, ma um, the mass of the sun, it's about one tenth the mass of the sun, which is you know, participating in nuclear reaction. And for each you know, nucleon, which, is, which has a mass of 930 you know, in the MEV, you release about 6 MeV going from you know, hydrogen to helium. So it is that fraction, about 0.6%, which is converted to radiation. And so 0.6% of the And you know, that is you know, as long as the sun is likely to live on the main sequence. It has gone through about half of this time so far. So now you know, here are some uh, results of calculations of solving those set of, you know, stellar evolution equations you know, you know, at zero edge main sequence for a whole set of stars, which are computed using uh, a solver, which you know, solves those equations. And as you can see, you know, as I go from lower mass to higher mass, they all line up in this diagram, which is you know, temperature, surface temperature versus luminosity on the zero edge main sequence, which I had shown you earlier. Now, If you compare the internal structure of um, stars in the zero edge main sequence, you know, I have compared the um, structure of the two stars here. One is a one solar mass star, one is a nine solar mass star. Of course, the nine solar mass star has more mass. Now, if I do, you know, normalize the you know, stellar structure by mass, and you know, so therefore internally the star goes from the Lagrangian coordinate, you know, small m, divided by total mass from zero to one, then you can see the density distribution is certainly higher in the sun than a star which is more massive than the sun. So the interior density reduces as the stellar mass increases on the main sequence. This is something that uh, uh, I already uh, indicated when you are doing uh, the rough uh, description of stellar structure that the density, central density is roughly proportional to one by m squared. On the other hand, if you look at the temperature, then a uh, higher mass star is uniformly more um, has a more higher temperature compared to a uh, lower mass star. This is one solar mass, this is nine solar mass. However, as you can see, the central temperature in this hydrogen burning region is not drastically different. It's in different, different by a factor of a few. But it's not different by an order of magnitude or more than an order of magnitude. And this is the result of the fact that you know, hydrogen ignition uh, is a very sensitive um, function of temperature and the hydrogen ignition is what you know, generates the luminosity in both these stars when they're on main sequence. Okay, so now let's take a look at a you know, evolution of um, let's say one solar mass star you know, as a function of time. So what I've plotted here is uh, a red shows the radius as a function of time, and blue shows the uh, uh, luminosity as a function of time. 
the sun starts from a large rather diffuse uh, gas blob so uh, let's say it started <coughs> somewhere earlier and then here we are at 1000 years so uh, we still have uh, a large gas blob over here so, uh, so this is <coughs> radius in units of solar radius um, so therefore this is the current solar radius this is 10 times the solar radius so you have a an object which is more than which is nearly 10 times the size of the sun but with the same mass as the mass of the sun and as time goes on the object contracts now at this point it is still thermal pressure supported and the contraction occurs because the energy is being radiated out and it is not being replenished by nuclear nuclear fusion so this contraction occurs in thermal time scale so you know, as you can see you know, over about 10 million years this then contracts and eventually settles to the zero age main sequence at zero age main sequence you have a radius which is close to the current solar radius you know, and you know, it then has a temperature which is you know, So this is the surface temperature, which is in the, in the, in the temperature which is again uh, close to the current surface temperature of five thousand seven hundred degrees. Now, in the, as time goes on, the you know, hydrogen in the core is getting consumed slowly, and over time, the stellar structure is going to change slightly because of that. currently we are here this is the present age of the sun so um, since i have normalized everything with respect to the current values in the luminosity as well as um, radius so those values in the, in the log of those values are zero at the current point so as you can see at zero age main sequence the star was both smaller as well as somewhat less luminous than it is now and as in the main sequence evolution proceeds the star begins to expand slightly and its luminosity begins to rise at some point the core hydrogen is exhausted and the nuclear fusion there cannot proceed anymore so at that point the star sort of splits into its evolution the inner part the core starts contracting and the energy released in that process expands the outer envelope to a very large size so the star goes to a red giant phase so this outer radius this expands very quickly to <clears throat> several thousand times in the solar radius and the luminosity also increases accordingly so we have a very big luminous star here which is called the red giant and eventually the envelope uh, will become very distended and it will leave the star and the core part which was contracting will uh, uh, keep contracting will get supported by degeneracy pressure and leave a white void so if you look at the composition at the center uh, at zero age main sequence this is uh, the composition of hydrogen in red and composition of helium in blue at zero age main sequence you had about you know, 70% 75% hydrogen and 25% helium which is the primordial composition and you know, as a function of radius of the star or this is mass coordinate this is the surface and uh, this is deep in the interior this is log of mass coordinate nuclear reaction occurs in uh, this region This is logarithmic coordinate number. So this is about one third the star. So um, the composition was the same all through the star at the beginning when the star arrived at the main sequence, and then the nuclear reaction started. As the nuclear reaction starts, the um, hydrogen starts getting converted into helium. So let's take the um, 
uh, innermost point here. So over time, from zero edge main sequence to now, the hydrogen composition has reduced from 70%, 75% over here to less than 40% now. And the helium composition has thereby gone up from about 25% to over 60%. So this is near the center. And uh, since nuclear reaction uh, occurs over an extended region, this uh, process affects not just the deep interior, but a significant fraction of the star, about one-third one, one of the star in, in, uh, in mass. And in, uh, as you can see, in the, over this entire region, the hydrogen has been converted to helium and the, the, the composition has changed from zero edge main sequence to now. And this is a gradual process. And this will continue to change as in, uh, the hydrogen abundance keeps going down to very low values, eventually the hydrogen burning at the center will stop. This evolution, if you uh, display on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram of in, uh, in the luminosity in solar units and in, uh, effective temperature in Kelvin, logarithm of that plotted here, the solar evolution, which I've uh, described earlier in terms of you know, radius, excuse me, and uh, luminosity you know, can be shown in this diagram as temperature and luminosity as follows. Before the star <clears throat> arrives at the main sequence, it follows a track like this. This you know, continues for about 10 million years from the time it started contracting. So in 10 million years, it arrives at the zero main sequence. It lives for about 10 billion years around this region. And after that, once core hydrogen is exhausted, the star moves up this branch. This is the post-main sequence branch. And uh, that's when the star converts itself into a red giant. And then you know, the post-main sequence evolution follows. You can have the envelope lost. You know, for the sun, there will be a second contraction because the helium will burn. And you know, after helium burning, you'll have again another expansion like that. And then you'll have a white dwarf left. And the entire you know, outer envelope will be lost. So this kind of evolutionary track can be you know, constructed for stars of any mass. So here's a whole uh, bunch of evolutionary tracks computed by you know, these authors. And you can see that you know, as you go to higher and higher mass, the evolutionary tracks sort of you know, change somewhat in shape. For you know, lower masses, you have this you know, you know, very fast rising branch on the right hand side, which is called the Hayashi part of the track, where the star becomes convective and the star quickly moves to red giant branch with uh, large radius expansion. For you know, higher mass stars, the stars are already big to start with. And uh, you don't have this you know, right hand you know, fast rising uh, branch, but you know, the stars still go to pretty large radii and go to you know, lower temperatures. <clears throat> Once you move straight right into this diagram, the star is expanding significantly in radius because you have the same luminosity, but in a lower temperature. And the luminosity is proportional to r squared t to the power of four. So to compensate for the you know, drop in temperature, your R should co correspondingly be larger. So these are called supergiant stars, these are called red giant stars, and these are called, um, the stars in the main sequence are called dwarfs. Okay, <clears throat> so what we have seen so far is that uh, the stars you know, begin their lives as you know, homogeneous mixtures of gas, nearly three quarters hydrogen and about a quarter helium and a small amount of heavier elements. <coughs> nuclear fusion occurs in the hottest region of the star, which is the core. And the stars spend most of their life burning hydrogen, where you know, four you know, protons combine to you know, produce helium. And the composition of the core is that thus altered. So you have the hydrogen burning core where it is hot enough. And then uh, since there is a temperature gradient, you know, 
is in the, uh, the temperature is highest at the center and it drops outside there is a boundary uh, uh, outside of which the uh, material is not hot enough to burn hydrogen so the hydrogen burning is confined within this inner inner, inner region which is called the core and the rest is called the envelope but eventually the hydrogen in the core is exhausted and the burning will stop so once the burning stops then <coughs> the core will start contracting in thermal time scale just as the full star was contracting before there was any nuclear burning so as the uh, core starts contracting it starts getting hotter and the regions around this boundary will also start getting hotter and as they get hotter they will move into the temperature region where hydrogen fusion can ignite so as the gravitational contraction proceeds the gas gets hotter you know, e thermal is you know, minus half e gravitational e gravitational is you know, rising as minus e gravitational is rising therefore e thermal rises therefore the material gets hotter and you know, the gas surrounding the contracting core now becomes hot enough to burn hydrogen in a shell so you now have an inert helium core and a hydrogen burning shell and this hydrogen burning shell uh, can actually have a significant amount of volume and a large amount of mass uh, in the burning region and can produce a luminosity at a very high rate and this you know, luminosity which is now generated will then you know, um, escape from the star the rate of escape of energy will be larger and therefore the star has to expand itself to carry that luminosity so an envelope becomes more distended so that is the red giant phase in that the star gets into so now you have a core which is getting denser and denser an envelope which is getting less and less dense so a clear demarcation begins to occur at the edge of the core, the burning shell if the contraction proceeds long enough then the core temperature may rise high enough to ignite the next stage of nuclear burning where three alpha particles combine to produce a carbon nucleus so that also produces energy at a very significantly higher rate than the hydrogen burning rate and in a so that extra luminosity will then heat up the core and the core which was contracting then until then will suddenly start expanding now so as the core starts expanding the temperature of the gas which is overlying the core which was burning hydrogen now that part will weaken a bit because now the core expanded so the temperature here will drop a bit and so the luminosity coming from the hydrogen burning shell will be somewhat lower now the shell will not disappear but the it will contribute a lesser fraction of the you know, total luminosity and the net luminosity to, you know, from the core plus the shell itself will actually go down the envelope you know, because the total luminosity has gone down now will contract and you will get a more compact star which is burning helium at its core and this is called helium main sequence and so these stars roughly all have luminosity about 100 times the solar luminosity and but this helium burning will soon be over and after the helium burning is over the core contraction will start again and depending on the nature of the you know, density of the star and so on we might you know, then ignite carbon or not in ignite carbon or you know, leave the you know, helium you know, burn composition that is carbon and oxygen as a you know, carbon oxygen white dwarf 
So the stable equilibrium can occur as long as helium burns. A core helium exhaustion would trigger the next stage of core collapse. Now, what will happen after that will depend on you know, what the mass of the core is and what the density is and so on. Okay. So uh, we have uh, now realized that in this later stages of stellar evolution, we have a structure of the star which is clearly demarcated between a significantly more dense core and a significantly less dense exterior, which is an envelope. So it's a core envelope configuration. This is in a, typically an inert core <coughs> surrounded by a burning shell. The equilibrium in such a structure requires the following. It requires that the pressure at the surface of the core and the pressure at the bottom of the envelope must equal. The temperature at the surface of the core and the temperature at the bottom of the envelope must equal. So, so mechanical and thermal balance, if it has to be achieved, then these two conditions must be satisfied. Now the core is not burning. It is roughly at a uniform temperature, it's you know, isothermal. And the core surface pressure can be given as you know, the you know, total energy, you know, that is you know, twice E thermal plus E gravitational. You know, <coughs> so this comes from the Virial theorem. You know, it's four pi RC cubed times the pressure at the surface of the configuration. So this pressure, for, you know, in the earlier form of the Virial theorem, we had put to zero. But here, we take the core, the surface pressure is not zero, but it is finite. So we keep that term. So four pi RC, RC cubed times PC is whatever we had on the, in the Virial theorem, that is twice the thermal energy plus gravitational energy. So that can be written as you know, some constant times you know, mass of the core times the you know, temperature. So this is you know, this constant has a specific heat in it. Mass of the core times you know, you know, temperature divided by R C cubed, because R C cubed comes from here. Minus another constant times you know, m squared by R four, which we have already seen. This is m you know, proportional to m squared by R. And there's an R cubed here, so this is proportional to m squared by R4. Now, envelope base pressure, we know that you know, this is like the, in the central pressure in star, and you know, we know that that also goes as the T squared by M squared, sorry, T to the power of 4 by M squared, or which is also right in M squared by R to the power of 4. This is another constant C3 times. T e to the power of four by m squared. So uh, when uh, you need to have mechanical and thermal balance, you need to uh, equate these, put T equal to uh, T c and P equal to P c. But if you look at the <coughs> value of P c as a function of R c, then you see that uh, because of these two terms, this curve has a maximum. And that maximum value is some constant times Tc to the power of four over mc squared. So a balance like that is only possible if the pressure at the base of the envelope is less than this maximum pressure. So if the envelope pressure is lower, let's say envelope pressure value is somewhere here, then you can balance it. But if the envelope pressure is very high, which is somewhere up, up here, then the core cannot, cannot balance it. So the, since the PC has a maximum, so therefore your PE needs to be less than PC max. And that translates to a condition that MC over M has to be less than the sum, ratio of the sum of these constants. And this is called a value is QSC or Schoenberg Chandrasekhar limit. It's not the, Ch the Chandrasekhar limit of the maximum mass of the world, but 
but the Schoenberg Chandrasekhar limit on the um, um, fraction of the core mass in the um, uh, in the star. Only if the um, core mass is less than a certain fraction of the star can this um, balance occur. If the core mass grows beyond this, then the core will collapse. Uh, it cannot be balanced uh, by the, you know, the thermal pressures that you know, exist within the star. So the core is then going to contract. Uh, if the core mass grows beyond a certain size, it, is, it cannot be supported anymore. And it is going to go on to contract and contract and contract until it is supported by degeneracy pressure. So you know, if I add the degeneracy pressure branch, to the thermal pressure uh, diagram in the previous uh, diagram, then I have this rising branch at a smaller radius. So uh, suppose uh, there's an envelope where uh, when the core mass is still small, then you have a balance over here. By the way, this intersection is, does not represent a balance because uh, this is unstable. That means you know, if you, you know, well, let's just go back to the previous diagram once to you know, explain that. So let's say you know, the envelope pressure is over here. So it, you can have an equilibrium either at this radius or at this radius. Now, if you have equilibrium at this radius, then let's say you perturb the equilibrium, you know, you make it, let's say, you know, squeeze a little more. If you squeeze a little more, then you see that the core pressure rises above the envelope pressure. So therefore, uh, as a result, the star will expand back and come back to this position. If you pull it out a little bit, then the uh, envelope pressure will become larger than the core pressure. So this is going to squeeze it back to this position. So this is stable. But exactly opposite would happen if you consider this as the equilibrium point. If the uh, core pressure increases, if if you squeeze it, then the core pressure will decrease, and it will then lead to further and further squeeze. If you expand it a little bit, then the core pressure will rise, and it will start expanding it further and further. So this point is not in a stable equilibrium point. The equilibrium point occurs on this branch of the curve, and similarly with the degeneracy pressure, it will occur over here. So. Uh, uh, Envelope with mass m equal to m1 has a possible uh, equilibrium point either over here or over here. But if the uh, core exists in, uh, with a, in a, in a certain mass mc, which produces this, then uh, the uh, uh, equilibrium occurs here and the core radius is given by this. Now, as the you know, shell you know, source keeps burning, it you know, keeps producing more and more material, you know, the product of the burning, which gets added to the core. And core mass keeps increasing with time. So as core mass increases with time, this curve will keep getting lower and lower. And at some point, it will just drop below this envelope pressure. And as soon as it drops below the envelope pressure, the support here will disappear. The next support comes only over here. So very quickly, the star will move from this point to that point in dynamical time. Now. So uh, that uh, uh, contraction will lead to a very rapid expansion of the outer envelope of the star. and it, uh, quickly goes from, uh, 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 from a uh, course, uh, uh, core uh, uh, burning support or uh, uh, core, uh, larger core support to a degenerate core support. And uh, that, uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, so that gives a very quick progress to a giant phase.
So if uh, the final degeneracy support uh, is uh, occurs at a uh, mass which is less than the Chandrasekhar mass, then that configuration will be left forever and you'll get a wide wall. Otherwise, uh, you can uh, keep burning uh, other uh, stages of nuclear burning and eventually uh, exceed Chandrasekhar mass. You can get uh, collapse and go to a neutron star. Uh, we can uh, quickly recall the nuclear burning stages. So you know, from here, hydrogen to helium, as you can see, the you know, energy released is more than 6 MeV per nucleon. And then the major burning stages are from hydrogen to helium, helium to carbon, carbon to oxygen, oxygen to neon, neon to magnesium, magnesium to silicon, and silicon to iron. Beyond that, the, there is no nuclear fusion generating energy because the energy per nucleon reduces as you go to higher atomic numbers. So the energy generating nuclear fusion stops at the iron peak elements. So once iron peak elements are generated in the core, that core will not again ignite and produce any thermal support. So if you do go through multiple stages of nuclear burning, the maximum you can go to is iron, iron peak elements. And then the shell burning sources will keep adding material to the core and uh, uh, the core will keep growing. As I've said that uh, the internal density of more massive stars are lower. So if you look at how the progression in the central temperature and central density uh, plane occurs in, uh, of these stars. So this comparison of a one solar mass star and a seven solar mass star. So uh, as the you know, uh, evolution proceeds, as you can see the center gets denser and denser. And you know, the you know, bluer this region is, the more degenerate the region is. The degree of degeneracy means that you know, what is the you know, value of the Fermi energy in comparison to thermal energy. So this line here um, is a rule of thumb dividing line between degenerate and non-degenerate, where EF by KT is of the order of 10. So um, Fermi energy is 10 times larger than the thermal energy. So um, the one solar mass star would cross the degeneracy line and then by the time it comes to helium ignition, the um, core is strongly degenerate over here. On the other hand, a seven solar mass star you know, approaches helium ignition with, you know, you know, in a relatively non-degenerate condition. But there are consequences to this. So the consequences of this are the following. So you know, <coughs> degeneracy can limit nuclear burning. As I have already shown you before, that you know, you know, degeneracy can limit nuclear burning from ever, ever occurring. So if the uh, stellar mass is you know, small enough, if the uh, configuration mass is small enough, you're not going to ignite hydrogen. But uh, as you go to higher and higher mass cores, now we are talking about the core mass, not the total mass of the star. You burn hydrogen first, and then the core contracts. And you know, if the core is not massive enough, it will be held by degeneracy pressure before it can come to helium burning. So these objects will end their lives as helium white dwarfs because uh, once the hydrogen burning has taken place, you have produced helium in the core and that helium does not further transmute into heavier elements. So you have helium white dwarfs that are left by stars which end their life in this region. And the maximum mass of uh, helium uh, white dwarfs is about 0 0.45 solar mass. If the mass exceeds 0 0.45 solar mass, then you uh, go above this point and you're able to ignite helium. 
and produce carbon and oxygen as uh, products. So over uh, the point between this and this, which is uh, helium uh, burning ignition and the uh, carbon ignition line, you have you'll be left with you know, white dwarfs of composition which are of carbon and oxygen, and that goes to about one point two solar mass or so. Above one point two solar mass, <coughs> you can have a region where you, know, you can burn burn carbon, but you know, after burning carbon, <coughs> you don't you know, go through the next stage of nuclear burning, and you, know, you are stopped by degeneracy pressure. So that can go from about 1.25 to about 1.4 solar mass. And those objects have a composition which is oxygen, neon, magnesium. So these objects will end their lives as oxygen, neon, magnesium, one more. Now, if the core mass exceeds 1.4 times the mass of the sun, then that is no longer possible. So they will then go through further contraction and further stages of nuclear burning and proceed all the way to iron. So, um, uh, for example, um, here uh, are depicted you know, some of the um, uh, evolutionary tracks in the density versus temperature, central density, central temperature. One solar mass star is a pre-main sequence compaction. This is the main sequence. Then, as I showed you, it proceeds this way. Then there is a um, Helium ignition, the helium ignition produces too much energy and then it is the degeneracy is lifted. It goes to non-degenerate branch. And then you know, once the helium burning finishes, then the star you know, contracts again and then goes to a carbon oxygen white dwarf. About 0.6 solar mass white dwarf will be left from a one solar mass star. For less massive stars in the main sequence, you may get you know, helium white dwarfs up to about 0.45 solar mass, as I said. Now, a two solar mass star also does something similar. Take a seven solar mass star, it goes there, and then it does helium ignition, and then it produces a carbon oxygen core, and then <clears throat> goes to white dwarf, white dwarf mass about one solar mass. Take a 15 solar mass star, it goes to hydrogen ignition, helium ignition, but then it goes also through carbon ignition, and then it proceeds to you know, further stages of you know, nuclear burning. So there's you know, different stages of nuclear burning, you know, which can follow, uh, include the carbon burning to you know, neon. Let's see. <clears throat> then you know, neon going to oxygen, and oxygen going to silicon, and silicon going to iron. So these are different stages of nuclear burning that can occur. And you can have a massive star, for example, here. This is 20 solar mass star. It goes to carbon burning, neon burning, oxygen burning, silicon burning, and then you get the iron in the core. And these are more massive, star, you know, massive stars. This is a helium star of eight solar mass, which would have come from a main sequence star of more massive you know, in, uh, configuration. This is an 80 solar mass star, and this is a 36 solar mass helium star, and so on. So these uh, stars will uh, go through all, all these stages of nuclear burning. And uh, you'll be uh, left at the end with an iron core, which cannot burn anymore, which will be surrounded by a silicon burning shell which will be surrounded by an oxygen burning shell, which will be surrounded by a neon burning shell, which will be surrounded by a carbon burning shell, then a helium burning shell, and then a hydrogen burning shell, and then the envelope. So each of these shells produces the mm, mm, element which is used as fuel in the next shell. So hydrogen produces helium, and then helium comes into this shell, and helium burns, produces carbon, which produces neon, which produces oxygen, which produces silicon, and which produces iron, and then iron keeps getting added to this shell, added to this core. And the mass of the iron core keeps increasing. And since there is nothing to limit this, the mass of the iron core will keep increasing, and it will keep getting smaller and smaller, it will contract, 
you'll get degeneracy pressure supported and uh, eventually its mass will exceed the Chandrasekhar limit, just exceed the Chandrasekhar limit. Once it just exceeds the Chandrasekhar limit, the pressure support here cannot support it anymore and then you will have a collapse in a dynamical time scale. And that collapse is very fast. So um, this is a very dense object. For, uh, for the sun, we saw the dynamical time scale is about an hour. For um, uh, a very dense inert iron core supported by um, electron degeneracy pressure, the um, uh, dynamical time scale is only uh, um, a few seconds. So the whole core will uh, collapse in a few seconds and that will generate a very quick burst of energy release, which is you know, and that luminosity is so high that you know, it will accelerate the outer envelopes to you know, speeds which are larger than the escape speed and you'll get a supernova. And so th total energy released in such supernovae <coughs> is about 10 to the power of 53 ergs, most of which is carried away by neutrinos which are produced in the process. About 1% of it goes into the kinetic energy of the ejecta, which is you know, sent out. And about 1% of that goes in radiative luminosity that is produced in the supernova. There is heavy nucleosynthesis that occurs because there are fast particles, you know, neutrons, you know, which are produced in the process, which interact with the material around here and produce you know, heavy elements. <clears throat> so elements above iron are produced in this fashion by you know, you know, rapid nucleosynthesis and you can have the core left as a you know, very dense you know, compact star you know, and you know, they can have fast spinning you know, you know, you know, compact you know, remnants left and you know, the rotational energy can also you know, make the some part of the ejected material very anisotropic and be ejected in jets, which you know, give rise to gamma bursts. So you know, this process I just described has the core, which has you know, been produced in the you know, in this nuclear burning. This inert core, you know, once it you know, exceeds the level that can be supported by degeneracy pressure, it quickly collapses. And inside the core, the density keeps increasing. And at the center of the core, the density is maximum. At some point, it reaches the density where the nuclear forces are able to stop for the collapse. And this sudden halt generates a shock wave. And this shock wave then moves out and then moves out through the core and then through the outer envelope of the star. This is called the core bounce. And uh, then it can uh, cause the explosion of the outer envelope, giving the supernova. So this is the point at which I stop today. And uh, we'll take questions. Thank you, Deepankar. So yeah, we have uh, uh, around four questions. So. Let me read out the questions and then in the meantime, I request other people to keep on writing, uh, write, writing the questions, whatever you feel like asking. So the first question um, over here. Okay, so asked by Surendra and he asks that, so the reaction rates and network are temperature dependent, right? And this yes. is how the temperature enters EOS makes it temperature gradient. Probably he was asking the question when you were talking about the equations uh, in a lab. No, temperature enters state. the equation of state um, very um, directly, right? Because it's a thermal pressure supported equ um, equation of state, which is um, uh, the pressure is proportional to density times temperature. So um, uh, it is uh, not just uh, reaction rates, but uh, the temperature is directly responsible for the pressure. So, but the change in this uh, coefficient, which is density times temperature, the density is actually the particle density. So for a given mass, the number of particles depends on composition. So as the composition changes, 
this uh, coefficient will keep changing. Okay, should we move to the next question? Uh, so there was one question uh, a person asked in YouTube and the question was since sun will shine up to 10 mega years though it has stopped generating energy so we will know after 10 mega years whether sun stops generating energy inside the core yes so um, after the nuclear burning stops then it should take 10 mega years to uh, change its appearance which is correct so, uh, it's over the thermal time scale it will change its appearance but as I've told you that uh, the post man sequence evolution is not that simple. The nuclear burning just does not uh, stop at one point. The core nuclear burning will stop and then uh, there will be a little core contraction then the shell, burn, shell burning will start. And that then drives all this uh, evolution away from the main sequence, the change of appearance and so on. But yes, the typical time scale to go through uh, uh, the change of appearance is uh, in this phase at least driven by uh, thermal time scale which is about 10 mega years okay so the next question is from vc paul asking that a radius of a star increases enormously in the red giant phase at the same time it is luminous uh, at the same time, its luminosity increases enormously. What is the source of this increase in luminosity? Yeah, the source of increase in luminosity is uh, uh, basically twofold. Uh, before the shell burning starts, the uh, core is contracting. And uh, this contraction of the core releases uh, um, a lot of gravitational um, energy. And this gravitational energy needs to be transported. So it converts itself into heat and um, that um, drives the luminosity of the star. And uh, shortly afterwards, the um, shell burning starts around the contracting core. And uh, this um, uh, hydrogen shell burning um, uh, generates energy at an enormous rate, um, much higher than what the core was doing before, because the density is now higher and the Temperature is also higher because the core has contracted and the local temperature is higher. And the, the density has increased uh, as the, again, the core has contracted to a smaller size, the local density has you know, gone up. And uh, so you have uh, energy production in the hydrogen burning shell uh, at a rate which is you know, significantly larger than what was happening in the core. And this you know, luminosity needs to be uh, disposed of at the surface and the star expands as a result so that at a given temperature you can still uh, carry that you know, luminosity. So the, yeah, so the source of the luminosity is the enhanced burning in the shell as well as the gravitational energy released from the core. So uh, Rudrupiya wants to know what is the discrepancy between the observed and the theoretical HR diagram? I'm not sure that's a <clears throat> well-framed question. What one does is to construct the, the theoretical HR diagram. There are parameters which you adjust to construct okay. the theoretical HR diagram, mm -hmm. which has to do with the stellar mass, stellar composition, uh, uh, and so on. So uh, the idea is to match the uh, observed HR diagram. And uh, that is how we understand the interior physics. So, um, I would say that the observed HR diagram is a guide to the theory to tell us what is, you know, what is the interior uh, uh, composition and uh, uh, temperature distribution, etc. in the star. Okay. So, the next question is by uh, Shomendro and He's asking what is the source of rotational energy of the star and how does rotation affect stellar evolution? The um, rotation is uh, sort of ubiquitous in the universe. So um, even uh, in the molecular cloud from which the um, uh, stellar gas mass would have contracted to produce the star would have had some rotation. 
even from a local turbulence in a molecular cloud, if you pinch off one part of the turbulent material, it will have a net rotation. And this rotation, just by conservation of angular momentum, will continue to have a significant rotation as the star contracts. Its angular velocity will keep going up. So in fact, in the process of contraction, rotation may sometimes be a hindrance. So you have to get rid of angular momentum for the gas cloud to collapse enough to uh, start burning hydrogen. And people invoke magnetic fields and so on to be able to carry away angular momentum from the pre-main sequence uh, collapsing uh, cloud to eventually be able to arrive at the main sequence. So rotation does therefore influence the um, evolution of the star by making it uh, slower. And if the internal rotation in, inside the star near stellar core is very, very large, then uh, yes, of course, it will have an effect both in terms of introducing an isotropy in the, uh, in the in, in, in dense, in density as well as the temperature distribution and therefore the luminosity distribution in the inner part of the star, as well as in, um, in the consequence, uh, changing the uh, various time scales. Uh, so uh, this is clearly one of the parameters that goes on, goes in modeling the stars. Uh, when you look at a star and try to match its properties from uh, first principles calculations. Okay. So the next question is from Parul and she's asking what is the outer envelope made up of? Given that the core only burns up till iron, how are the higher elements like gold uh, made? So uh, outer envelope of the star is made up of the same material that the star was formed from. So if it's the primordial uh, composition, then it is only hydrogen and helium. If it is, let's say, solar composition, it is uh, hydrogen and helium mostly, but it's about 2% heavier elements. You know, because in you know, every cycle of star formation and uh, uh, dissipation you know, adds you know, more heavier elements and enriches the material in heavier elements. So when the sun was formed, the you know, there's, uh, there was about 2% of heavier elements already uh, in the mixture of the gas. And that is the, um, in the composition of the outer envelope. Now, um, in core nuclear burning, you can produce um, uh, elements up to iron um, in uh, um, significant quantities. There are, of course, some side reactions to this um, with um, much smaller branching ratios, which can produce you know, if, you know, a trace amounts of you know, heavy elements during this phase itself in this you know, S process or slow process of nuclear burning, but not so much, not very much. A larger fraction of heavier elements are produced when in the, in the core collapse, you have quick neutronization of material, and some of these neutrons escape from this you know, collapsing core and then bombard the material that will eventually go out. And these neutrons are very quickly absorbed because they're fast neutrons going you know, at high energy through the material. They are quickly absorbed one after another by the material which is you know, overlying the core. And as a result, at a given charge number, the mass number suddenly increases to very, very large values, which are, of course, not in, uh, in, uh, nuclear in equilibrium. But because of the rapid capture of neutrons, before this uh, nuclear, uh, nucleus has a chance to decay, you can capture more and more and more neutrons. Then, when this material is left to itself, this will undergo beta decay and its charge number will start increasing. And 
many of the heavier elements can be produced in this fashion whether the entire abundance of heavy elements like gold can be produced in this fashion there is debate about that it doesn't look like supernova art process can make you know, all the gold and platinum and so on that we see but now we have found a much richer source of you know, uh, these heavy elements and that is you are left with these neutron stars at the end and you could have two such neutron stars going around each other in a, in a binary system and at some point come together due to gravitational radiation and collide and merge and some amount of this neutron rich material is ejected in the process now this material is extremely neutron neutron rich to start with and once it is ejected into free space it undergoes in a, in a beta decay neutron decay and this process can produce huge amounts of very high charge number nuclei and it is likely that most of the gold that we see have originated in events like this the double neutron star merger and the next question is uh, from subhash and he's asking in thermal time scaling what is l and its uh, physical significance l is luminosity so let me go back to that this is the number you're talking about right so i uh, can you see this slide? yeah your slide is visible uh, okay. i assume is talking about this thermal time scale right so uh, yeah thermal time scale, thermal yes. is the total thermal energy content so amount of thermal energy which is you know resident in the star at any given point l is the luminosity which is the rate at which the star is losing energy which is the radiative luminosity that you observe so this thermal energy is being lost at this rate so this ratio is therefore gives you the time that it will take to drain the entire thermal energy right so that gives you the thermal time scale and the thermal energy itself can be written in terms of the gravitational energy because of the vl theorem so we can write this as gm squared by 2r that is the thermal energy divided by l which is the luminosity so for for the sun for example you can measure all of this you know what the mass is you know what the radius is and you can you can measure what the luminosity is so you can just plug in those numbers and then see how much the you know, yeah. value works out to be and it will be about 10 million yeah okay. so the next question is from uh, devaruti and uh, she is asking why are neutron stars not depicted along with white dwarfs on the hz diagram hr diagram okay well, you can very well yeah. uh, uh, you can easily do that actually now so here is the main sequence white dwarfs are here if you want to describe neutron stars they are way down in the lower left corner so if you want to bring them in this whole diagram will go up is a tiny bit over here so it is normally not depicted because then this entire main sequence will be a small line over here and the neutron stars will be there so that's the reason Why it is not usually depicted, but it can. Uh, there is no reason to uh, consider them to be not part of each other. We can easily be done. Yeah. So the next question is from Pratusha, and the question is: What is uh, the highest cosmological redshift at which we expect to see neutron stars and white dwarfs in our universe? whatever is the highest redshift at which massive stars are formed and uh, they might uh, uh, be even earlier than the first galaxies right so we don't know but it is certainly at uh, if you have uh, uh, capability to observe them then i would think that all the way up to redshifts of 6 or 10 we should be able to see you know, now new neutron stars the white dwarfs we do see gamma ray bursts in a pretty high redshift and in the so therefore core collapse 
uh, does occur to, uh, to those relationships, as well as you know, you know, would also expect you know, short gamma ray bursts to occur you know, in similar regions. So that means new stars also must exist. So yes, I think uh, if we do have the observing capability, we should be able to see them at very high altitude. Uh, Dibangar, I have a very naive question in this context that in many cases, theoretically, we have been people talk about of pop three stars required for at the very early galaxies, yeah. right? And uh, what uh, means uh, can they also end up in uh, the neutron stars or white dwarf like that? So uh, the no, there is opinion is divided on that but uh, what it looks like is uh, that uh, if the star happens to be extremely massive then uh, the uh, central uh, radiation density becomes so high that gamma gamma interaction can produce start producing electron positron pairs and the pressure of this uh, sudden production of electron positron pairs can uh, cause the whole star to explode, you know, perhaps without leaving uh, any remnant at all. So for extremely massive uh, stars, you might get a pair instability supernova, which mm. you know, may or may not leave a compact remnant. It's not very clear exactly what happens when the pair instability ensues. You might get a black hole, you might get a neutron star as a as a product in addition to the pair instability, or you might not be able to get anything at all. So no, it's not very clear at the moment. Okay. Thanks for your talk and all the answers to these questions. Okay, then uh, thank you everyone. Thank you, Dipankar. Yeah, thank you. For the lecture. So we'll see you tomorrow. In the